if they uh, didn't slam to the ground, we would, I mean, if, if they had slammed to the ground, you'd have a, a large pile of rubble sitting there on the ground afterwards. Mm -hmm. And that a large amount of debris was missing. Tower One is so overshadowed by this eight-story remnants of Building Six. What's wrong with this picture? You should have at least a hundred more stories of the north wall of Tower One. Where is the north wall? Where'd it go? Where are the towers? And apparently there's not one single toilet being recovered from the entire that, North that, World Trade Center. Yeah, and that's another observation that Judy mm -hmm. would have made, that, uh, you know, if you consider the, 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 the restroom facilities in the towers, you know, these, these huge uh, uh, complexes in the mm -hmm. sky with thousands of toilets, mm -hmm. they're shiny, they're brightly colored. Mm -hmm. Go and look through all the photographs of the debris, you will not find one of them. Where did they go? Okay, because it wouldn't necessarily all be broken down into tiny parts, would no. it? You'd have big chunks and small chunks and Correct. all different sorts. Of Whether you go with the official story of the pancake collapse and so on, or whether you go with this later story of bombs in the buildings, we call it BIB, bombs in the building, the building in either of those two sets of circumstances would have hit the ground. Basically, it would have clattered right. to, to the floor over a period of well over a minute. Yeah, something like, yeah, yeah. So you would have had a seismic trace up and down right. for up, right. over a minute, and it was less than eight seconds, and it was barely non it was practically but, non-existent. Yeah, well, it was, it was much smaller. I mean, Dr. Wood goes into the book and compares it with the Seattle Kingdom, which was very well recorded mm -hmm. in terms of video, photographs, what was on the ground afterwards, and also the seismic signature, and she compares that with the World Trade Center, which were much taller buildings mm -hmm. uh, and so on. So she has that direct comparison looking at the scientific data for those two things, and they clearly do not match up, which indicates from the seismic signal too, the building didn't hit the ground. If you remove two 500,000 ton buildings, you're gonna create a surface wave, but it only lasted eight seconds. You know it takes nine and a half seconds to throw a bowling ball off the roof of the towers and have it hit the ground? So how, does, how can this be? If the buildings had slammed to the ground, the seismic signal would have shown it. This is an earthquake that was in Manhattan in January of that year on the same bedrock. It was in Midtown Manhattan. So we can test how that bedrock carries a signal. 
This has a whole lot more high frequency waves, a whole lot more uh, going on. I call this the nozzle kind of leading up to the big signal. This is when the P wave arrives, the primary wave and then the secondary wave. And you can tell how far away an earthquake is by the delay of those if it travels through the ground. If it doesn't travel through the ground, you only get surface waves. Only surface waves. And look how much smoother it is. It's not that high frequency kind of rattling look. The Seattle Kingdom was a controlled demolition. And this is the signal it leaves. Notice it has an S wave and a P wave arrival. And it lasts like 52 seconds for the majority of it. The crime scene will tell you if you listen. I missed something. I didn't see something. Let's talk about the toasted cars because this is one of the most fascinating things for me. You've got various diagrams in your book which show where these car parks or where various cars were parked. And there's many, many testimonies of different responders who, who see cars all over the place exploding. Their engine block blocks bursting into flames this kind of thing. The most striking area is West Broadway. Mm -hmm. It goes past Building 7 and goes north for several blocks. And every car along there was toasted. What I mean by toasted is it's toast, is history. Mm -hmm. Not necessarily burning being the cause, just you have to repair it. You can't repair it, you have to buy a new one. You have to replace it. But all the cars along that road were toasted. There's, there's 1,400 yeah. of these damaged cars. Not just this isn't just one an isolated incident. The cars are like as far away as a quarter of a mile away. were getting damaged. You will see an image of the parking lot with the uh, cars in a normal state, and then the next frame of the video, you will see that the cars are still in the parking lot and they've been completely toasted. All right, so they oh, haven't right. moved. Where that car park is, there's a sea of unburned paper in between that wasn't ignited. Here's an example of a dodgy car, right? We've got a car yeah. here that's um, half damaged and half pristine. If you like, put your hand over one half of it, it looks like a new car. And the, the unmelted um, roof, the unmelted plastic lights on the roof. Yep, yep, that's, that's a pretty good picture. 
and we've got several yeah. pictures of that different different angles. And this, I yeah, I think I'm pretty sure this is on FDR Drive. This this car, um, yep. which is about half a mile well, away now. Sorry. This is this is an image that's been used to debunk Dr. Judy Wood because it's this this Correct. car I think's been found elsewhere and it's, although it's been moved from somewhere to here and people say, well, look, you're saying it's been found there and look like that. Irrelevant. Look at the car. <laughs> right. Whatever right. it happened, whatever happened to that car, it shouldn't have happened like that. So if it happened here or it happened yeah. underneath the World Trade Center, it wouldn't matter. It's a. Uh, you, you you make a very good point. It appears that there's something. Um, in the environment that has had an effect on, particularly on the on metal objects, basically. Metal being more easily affected than others, but there's different types of metal right. that are affected more easily, like the door latches, the trunk lids, the uh, uh, door handles on the cars. Those were pretty easily uh, destroyed quickly. So you've, you've looked at a lot of these effects, and basically you sort of say that, well, look, the, the whole, if you consider the whole body of evidence, it can't be explained by any of the other. But any, by any that... kinetic energy. Driving on the Manhattan Bridge, there were some EMTs, mm -hmm. emergency medical technicians, who spoke of you could feel the heat from the bridge. It was right. so hot you could feel the heat from the bridge. Mm -hmm. Well, the paper in between them and the towers, three quarters of miles away, mm -hmm. didn't burn. Right. So it wasn't conventional heat. It was something their body sensed. Right. As heat, so we we can't see it, but we can see things that are just like that. Like your microwave oven, you don't yeah. see that, but you see the effects. Yeah. And we also know that it affects um, liquid differently than dry paper. Mm -hmm. I mean, just consider microwaves just for a second, because it may be something akin to that that's being used. You know, if you put, I don't know, something on a piece of paper in a microwave, the paper doesn't get hot. I don't think. Does if it's it if it's dry. If right. it's dry. Um, if you put if you put a knife and fork in there, you get all of these flashes, which affects metal differently. Yeah, so it affects metal differently. So we can see that there's maybe a parallel to be drawn with microwaves, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, but now, but, my, but what that is a demonstration of mm -hmm. is that that's directed energy mm -hmm. in your microwave oven. Yeah. And what we saw in 9/11 had the same symptoms of some kind of directed energy, right. not kinetic energy. Okay, we've got a photograph up here, Andrew, and this shows an aerial view of where one of the towers was shortly after it had collapsed. Um, tell us about this picture. Yeah, well, this picture is one of the very interesting ones that Dr Wood uncovered and had pointed out some of the salient features of. The, 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 real, the main one, really, is the circular holes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you study this picture in detail, and these pictures are all, all available on Dr Judy Wood's website, mm -hmm. drjudywood.com, you can actually see 24-foot circular holes in, in these buildings. And how can debris falling from one of these towers mm -hmm. have created these circular holes? It doesn't make any sense. So there's sense. one to the top right here, is that right there? Yes. Is that correct? W yes. Where are the other ones then, Andrew? Because um, I can only see one there. Well, if you, you have to really zoom into that picture to see okay. some of the other ones. You can actually see a couple in the uh, pavement and in the street. Okay. Um, and Let I think just... on the next slide we've got, you know, you can actually see there uh, that that hole is made up of, of a number of smaller holes and, and these little cutout bites, which are also circular. Yeah, I can see around the edge here. Yes. Is that what you're talking yes. about? So it's like you've got circular columns cut out of it. Okay, so it's like a, almost being made by a, a sequence of circular. Yes, yes and this expression. So, what were the diameter of each one of those circles? Well, a lot of these have a common diameter of, of, of 24 feet. Okay. If you look carefully, you can see this the, this recurring feature. Is it this of these hole circular here in the cutouts. center? Is that? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and is there any other holes in that image? I mean, are not from, shadows not are from there. there. Okay. The, you know, again, if if you look at the others that are on Dr. Judy Wood's website, you'll see there there is okay. one which where she's highlighted holes in the pavement. Okay.
Get it, get it. One of the strange effects that Dr. Judy Wood catalogued was these weird fires. You see here, a raging car fire, paper only a few inches away, not burning. A fireman walking past some fire, all this paper around it is not burning. This looks like fire, but it's not conventional fire. It may turn into conventional fire at some point, but when it starts off, it isn't. This is John Hutchinson's experiment of trying to reproduce the Philadelphia experiment. And you'll see around the boat, if you haven't seen it already, bursts of flame just spontaneously happening. So that's one of the phenomena. Spontaneous fires. Bent beams. That's a copper bar, three inch diameter solid. It's not hollow after one of John's experiments. That's a beam from the World Trade Center. I'm going through this quite quickly. I've got this is all in the book and I've got booklets and all kinds of stuff. It's plain as day. Plain as day when you see it, when the comparison has been made. This is a police car, as you see, NYPD. Is it parked that way, do you think, on 9-11? Here's uh, John Hutchinson's reproduction of, uh, from a challenge for Ace Baker from November 2008. He was challenged a $100,000 bet to reproduce his levitation effect with this wrench by a chap called Ace Baker who I've written about in my book. John did the challenge. He reproduced the levitation. Of course, Ace Baker never showed up. We saw levitation effects. We saw the levitation of the, uh, the uh, wrench there. We've got a number of levitation accounts of witnesses. This is from Michael Mako. I realised I couldn't get out from under the collapse. I dove under the ESU truck that was facing north on the west side of West Street. I dove under that and waited for the building to come down. When the building did come down, I actually thought I was trapped and the truck was blown off me, pushed off me, I guess. It was not there. At that point, I was just really shocked and didn't know what was going on at that point. I didn't know. I was really, really shocked. So hang on a minute. It dies under this ambulance. The building comes down and the ambulance is gone. How did that happen? We've got a recently discovered a, a, the survivors in stairwell B. One of them describing coming down the stairs and he's got one of these you know, hard, heavy hard hats on and he says, he's, he's, he hears the building coming down and his hat starts lifting off and he grabs it on. Excuse me, why would his hat lift off? What's going on? South Tower came down, I was across the street and I picked up the camera just out of habit and something in the back of my mind said, run, run, run. And never in 20 years of shooting in New York have I run from an assignment but something in the back of my head just said, run. And as I hit the corner of Liberty Street, um, it was almost being picked up by a tornado, almost being picked it's up like by... a wave. It was like being picked up... With a, the black with, cloud. With that black there. cloud had substance. Mm. It was like night, but it had, yeah. had a solid feel to it. It was like gravel, hot gravel, mm. and just picked me up and tossed me about a block. I just, at one second I was running, and the next second I was airborne. And I, I, I lost my glasses, I lost my cell phone, I lost my pager, but managed to hold on to both cameras. Mm. But it threw you for a block? I was back down at Ground Zero last week and walked the area where I have a pretty good recollection of where I was and where I wound up. And it was, it was, just, under, it was just under a city block. He's a New York, New York Daily News photographer. He was levitated and carried a block. Look at these two cars placed on top of one another. They have literally an engine uh, that is melded together with other parts of the car. Moving over, you've got another car they moved here. It looks like it's been through a war. Uh, you can see uh, the papers, all the, uh, the burned out papers from the building. You see the soot and the dirt. It's this fused element of of steel, mo molten steel and concrete and all of these things all fused by the heat into one single element. And almost like a chunk of lava from Kilauea or Iceland where they're very sharp but, but breakable shards on the end here.
SEIC are manufacturers of directed energy weapons systems or components. SEIC were in charge of ground zero security the day after 9-11. Another speciality of that company is guess what? Psychological operations, folks. NIST, when they wrote their technical reports about how the World Trade Center was destroyed, which they received over $10 million, they used a number of contractors. And two of them were Science Applications International Corporation and Applied Research Associates, and also Boeing Supplied Data. They all do research in directed energy weapons. Just a coincidence, of course. They don't know anything. Real progress is being made in a laboratory in Canada. Here, the full significance of the physical laws of light and space have become clear to John Hutchison, and he is utilizing this knowledge to produce cause and effect experiments which lead to an understanding of the harmony of nature. Science, in harmony with the laws of nature for the good of mankind, will hold great values in many fields and would advance its course beyond our present comprehension. John Hutchison has been working in the areas of electromagnetic forces and the changes in the molecular structure of materials for many years. He has in this time achieved a breakthrough in anti-gravity knowledge, providing spectacular examples of heavy objects flying through the air without any visible signs of propulsion. He has also made amazing discoveries concerning the alteration of compositions of materials by subjecting them to a form of electromagnetic bombardment. But looking at something which you know shouldn't be happening. There is well, the, the, the dips in the magnetic field is uh, you've got the when the first plane hits the building, it, it dips first, then it, the, the second right. plane hit, it dips, and then it's haywire all day, and right till uh, 520 when the building seven comes down, and then it just goes back to normal. So whoever did 9-11 had to be able to move hurricanes around and affect the Earth's magnetic field at the same time, like in a cave with a satellite phone. Right, yeah, yeah. Something very unusual is going this on. This is a, a, an amplified trace of the Earth's magnetic field, which was measured by six different instruments run by the University of Alaska, and they're called magnetometers. During the events of 9-11, these things go haywire. These things go haywire. So something this very one, odd. This is one measuring station. This is six measuring stations. Correct. This is six different instruments. This is like a zoomed-in portion. And what Dr. Wood did is she downloaded the raw data from these magnetometers and she put it into an Excel spreadsheet. You can see that this deflection of the Earth's magnetic field, this divergence, started around about 8.15. And it carried on and reached a minimum point at 8.46. And then it kind of sort of recovered and went back the other way. And then it kind of reached a maximum at uh, uh, that where that brown line is, around about 9.03, 9.04. It started to just go down again. So uh, anyone know what happened at 8.46 on 9.11? It was when this alleged first plane struck. So what does this mean, folks? Do you think that a plane crash can affect and make a hole in the towers and it can affect the magnetic field as measured 3,500 miles away, which is where these instruments were. I suggest to you that, uh, I put it to you that we're looking at something off the charts of your current experience and knowledge if you've not been studying some of this separately. We're talking about energy effects. All, all of the evidence points to energy effects and none of it points to traditional, traditional explosives and nukes and bombs and thermite and any variation of that.
Hi, Abe. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me, Ryan. How is it that you came to begin questioning the 9-11 events? The first real incident that I remember um, that led me to question 9-11 was becoming very concerned with the wars and repeatedly hearing on television that the wars were happening because of 9-11. And this was around 2008 when I was getting towards the end of uh, studying biology at the University of Iowa in undergraduate college. Our country was on this trajectory to cause all this harm and to drop all these bombs when there's so many people here at home that really need our help and so many things could be improved. And so it's really just my concern for, for peace and wanting uh, to promote peace that led me to become very concerned. And that's what led me to actually... You know, unfortunately, I'm much wiser now, actually, but unfortunately at the time, um, that led me to become a supporter of Barack Obama, unfortunately, back in 2008, because um, I didn't think that well, all the things he was saying were going to turn out to be lies and false promises, but at least at the time, they sounded very good, and it sounded like someone who uh, wanted to promote peace and wanted to end these wars and wanted to close Guantanamo Bay. Um, so I naturally became a supporter of, of him and started telling other people that they should look into him and consider voting for him. One of my wiser friends um, kind of called me out at the time and Adam said, you know, he's a liar, he's not going to change anything, you need to look deeper into these topics. Um, and one of the topics she mentioned was actually 9-11. And she referred me to some websites that helped me to be exposed to some information that made me feel very confident uh, in my understanding that we had been lied to, that the 9-11 official story known as the 9-11 Commission Report was filled with lies and inaccuracies and omitted testimonies, and, uh, and I became very concerned that we had been lied to and that we were going to war with these countries based on lies, and that was very unsettling for me. So I naturally started uh, searching more for the truth within 9-11, starting to support organizations like Alex Jones uh, and Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth. And, uh, and I was very concerned, and that, that felt like to be the right solution for me was to support those organizations that appeared to be doing something about it. Uh, in one of the places I shared it with, in some Facebook 9-11 Truth group, I encountered uh, this other PhD professor uh, who is a biochemist, the really smart person who was concerned and was listening to what I had to say, and then she even went further and shared some information with me and said, you know what, bombs don't explain what happened. They don't even come close to explaining what happened. And so you should check out all this other set of facts, Abe, that you have not seen before. And I, she referred me to Dr. Judy Wood's website, who's also uh, a PhD professor and an engineer and a very well-qualified individual. What I found at her website was just, it just blew me away. And there was this collection of facts that were so well documented, so well referenced with almost all of the sources provided, um, things that just could not be ignored and could not be dismissed that showed conclusively that bombs do not explain what happened. In fact, the only thing that really explains what happens is, uh, is the fact that those buildings were turned to find dust in midair. And the only thing that really can do that, that is consistent with the evidence, is a general type of weapon known as a directed energy weapon. And um, it sounds very difficult to swallow when you hear that being said without first seeing the facts. And then I went back to these other truth groups to see if perhaps any of this information was on their websites, and it was not. None of these very important facts were on the Architects and Engineers for 9-11 Truth site or on Alex Jones' website baffled as to why these people who claim to be searching for the truth, why they were not sharing all of these truthful, factual, very important pieces of evidence. And it just didn't seem right to me. So I actually ended up messaging Richard Gage, sent him an email, asking him if he knew about these facts on Dr. Judy Wood's website. And if he did know about them, I'd like to know how he feels about them and why they're not on his website. Rather than getting the reply back from him, uh, I didn't get any answer to my question, and I actually got banned from the website. And I went back a couple weeks later to see if, you know, if maybe there was an update or maybe if I got a message through their website since I'd never heard back through the email. And when I went back to check, it turns out that my account and profile had been completely deleted. 
even though there was no controversial information or, or any reason for my profile to have been deleted. All they had done was sent him a private email. And, and, and there was no continue. response, no message to you? No, no, not at that time. So I was very concerned by that. It felt very unprofessional and very uh, suspicious, especially considering that I was a donor and supporter of them for over a year, or approximately one year. So I naturally started telling people that. I was going to other truth forums, and I would ask other people if they had these experiences with uh, 9-11 truth, and I would tell them about what happened to me and tell them what information I had sent them that led to that action. And I was really turning people on to Dr. Judy Wood's website and the facts that are presented there. That is when um, I got contacted by them. I ended up getting contacted by not Richard Gage, but by this volunteer coordinator named Mark Graham. And he basically tried to soften my concerns and, and say that he was sorry, you know, that they did that, but they felt like there was a potential that because I had come across all this information, there was a potential that I could put that into my Architects and Engineers for 9 Truth profile, or I could use that information to contact other people's profiles and send it to them, and they didn't want that to be happening. What he said was, it's not within the scope of our mission. You know, when someone's just sharing facts, it's amazing that they would delete someone's account completely to prevent them from sharing facts. So it just felt really suspicious we took lots of screenshots of that and documented it, and uh, he ultimately ended up offering to refund my donations, um, you know, to if I would stop telling people what happened, if I would be quiet. And I, I didn't accept that offer from them because I felt it was more important to tell people what happened and tell people the truth than to just get my little 80 bucks back or whatever it was. I really didn't care about that. In the normal sort of regular thermite, it's actually iron oxide and aluminium powder. You mix those two together, obviously fairly freely available, and you put in a hot fuse. You need a hot fuse of several hundred degrees centigrade to set it off, so you can't just start it with a match. You need a, some something like a magnesium strip uh, burning to set the thermite reaction going. You know what the more common name for iron oxide is? Uh, no. Go Rust. Oh, Rust. Uh, okay. So... Going back to the World Trade Center, what did we have as part of the structure? Well, we had uh, hundreds of steel girders. These steel girders have been standing in air for 30 years, approximately 30 years, perhaps slightly longer. Even. What do steel girders do when they've been standing in air for 30 years? They rust. Uh, and the shiny, silvery also... exterior of the World Trade Center was, guess what, folks? It was an aluminium alloy. So for those guys like Stephen E. Jones and Richard Gage to say that thermite was found in the World Trade Center dust or unreacted thermite, well, what they're, what they're saying really and what they're not saying to you is that the remains of the building were found in the dust of the remains of the building. That's what they're saying. Or what made up the building was found in the remains of the building. So this, this talk of thermite is a cover story. Now, of course, they will argue, oh, but that's... You know, we know that this wasn't made up from the building because it's got this special signature and we found nanothermite. But they haven't got any evidence for that. They, they can sort of make it fly because of what the building was made of. A measurable proportion of iron oxide and a significant proportion of aluminium. They don't want people to know and understand and realise and become aware of that the building's turn to dust before they hit the ground because that is a new type of process
And another part of my of the story that I forgot to share earlier um, that I'd like to really emphasize is involvement of Wikipedia in the censorship of uh, of this evidence um, and what is uh, going on and why they are not um, not only are they not sharing the evidence but they're actually actively preventing it from being shared on Wikipedia despite the fact that it is a public forum and a public place for discussion so I signed up uh, for an account on Wikipedia so that I could edit it because it's available to be edited by the public and I created a page uh, devoted to Dr. Judy Wood I created a, a page uh, that talked about her academic credentials talked about all of her peer-reviewed publications she has many many uh, peer-reviewed scientific publications in major engineering journals uh, and uh, her efforts as an academic professor as a scientist as a researcher they are uh, just unbelievably powerful in and of themselves aside from all of this 9-11 uh, effort that she has also put forth so I thought that she is well deserving of a Wikipedia page you know there's many people who have done much less for the world and achieved much less with their lives that have Wikipedia pages and I thought, of course, she deserves one. And so I created a page, uh, put a lot of her information on there, and in one small section of the page, I mentioned her efforts uh, in the 9-11 Truth community. I mentioned that she has assembled five facts. I mentioned that she has taken these facts and actually sued uh, the private corporations that were involved in the phony 9-11 investigations and the science fraud that occurred during those investigations. She actually sued them based on scientific merit, based on the Data Quality Act, trying to hold them accountable for the science fraud that they have put forth um, that continues to affect the world to this day. And I put some documents from her court case on there, and uh, it was just amazing because within a few hours of creating that Wikipedia page, uh, someone had already deleted it. Some moderator with higher powers had already deleted the page. and. I tried to recreate it, I tried to appeal it, and uh, that moderator would not allow that to be done, um, no matter what reasons I gave. And uh, so my next step was uh, to try and insert her name and website into the Wikipedia page called 9-11 Truth Movement, uh, because Wikipedia is not against discussing 9-11 Truth, they even have a page called the 9-11 Truth Movement page on Wikipedia. Um, so I thought, well, if I can't have her own page, then of course I can stick it in there, you know, stick a link to her website, stick her name, um, and mention her court case there. Um, and after reviewing that page, I felt even stronger about that possibility and that decision because there are many, many less qualified people um, who have contributed much less towards the actual discovery of the truth and alerting the public to the truth than Dr. Judy Wood has. For example, David Ray Griffin who is, I believe his PhD is in theology, you know, the study of religion. Um, he, uh, he is mentioned on that page several times. He has got lots of information there uh, discussing him and books he's written, and he's not even a scientist. Um, and so I thought, well, of course, like, she definitely belongs on this page. I'm going to stick her in there, and hopefully this will bring more attention to the facts that she has discovered and assembled for us. And uh, unfortunately, someone was even moderating that page very, very closely because within a matter of minutes of inserting one or two sentences about her into one of the paragraphs and inserting a link to her website at the bottom of the page where the supplementary links are all posted, there's a whole bunch of links at the bottom of the page, so I put her, her website on that list of links. Um, within a few minutes, someone had detected that and had deleted out those sentences I had added and deleted out the link to her website that I had added. It and seems it was like her. Very alarming. It seems like her name might be flagged on Wikipedia. Yeah, yeah, I would agree. Um, those are my suspicions that someone or a group of people were actively censoring and watching for any information about her, and they were just suspicions. You know, I didn't have any proof of it. I had this suspicious behavior, but the actual proof came during the appeal. So because it's a public forum, you're able to appeal decisions that are made by higher-ranking moderators. So if you feel like you've been mistreated or if you feel like information is not being edited appropriately, you can appeal those editing decisions to other moderators and see what they think, too. So I appealed the process, 
I appealed it to see uh, if I could get people to look closer and see the censorship that was happening. And the public policy of Wikipedia, I believe, is that um, public appeal discussions are meant to stay open for several days. I believe it's like five to seven days so that enough public moderators can log in, look at the debate, weigh in, give their vote, and then a decision is made after several days. But within something just like 12 hours, my appeal discussion was closed and locked down so that no one else could comment, it, comment, comment on it or edit it. And so that was a violation of Wikipedia's own policy in the way that this was addressed. And so in that process, I started actually individually messaging the moderators and saying, look, you have violated this website's policy. You know, you have completely broken the rules to try and censor this information that is completely appropriate for this page and more important than anything that's currently on this page. And I'm very unhappy about this, and I'm not going to stop bringing this up. I'm going to appeal it again and again and again until I get some type of real answers. And that is when two very, very important things happen, both of which I've documented with screenshots and we've created as an Internet article so that people can actually see what happened to me um, when this occurred. One is that my account was banned. So they completely banned my account because I was pointing out that they had broken the rules of the website to try and censor the information that I had put on there about Dr. Judy Wood. So that was one thing, that I was banned. My account was completely completely locked down so that I could no longer edit, no longer message other people. And then number two, that's when I got a message from one of the moderators that were involved in helping shut down the conversation and helping to censor the information that I was putting on onto that page. And his user account was named Hooper Bloob. Um, again, you can see these screenshots. Uh, I can refer you to the actual websites where they're hosted. Um, but Ultimately, it's what he said that is the second and most important thing of what happened with the Wikipedia exchange. He literally said to me, he said, Eve, he said, I would give, give, uh, give up on this topic. I would give it a rest. It's a waste of your time um, because even if you came up with good reasons, uh, better reasons that, there should, that she should be mentioned on this page, they wouldn't let you anyway because she is on a block list. Her name is blocked. And so he admitted to me that there is a block list that Wikipedia has and her name is on it. And so moderators are instructed to reflexively just block any mentioning of her or the material that comes with her name um, as part of their uh, part of the way the moderator system works there. Wow, they have and a so, special flagging specifically for Dr. Judy Wood. That's amazing. Wikipedia censors Dr. Judy Wood. Yeah, and it's amazing. And uh, on the other side of things, they do not censor any of the other 9-11 truth individuals. There's full-fledged discussion about Richard Gage uh, and Thermite and Alex Jones and Dmitry Kalizov, but no mentioning of Dr. Judy Wood. So it's okay to talk about everything else, thermite, bombs, explosives, nukes, jet fuel, whatever, but don't you dare talk about Dr. Judy Wood, otherwise they're going to freaking block that and they're going to ban you. <laughs> So it's just amazing, and uh, it's all documented in screenshot, screenshots and actual uh, snapshots of what actually happened, so you can read the exchange for yourself. You don't have to take my word for it or anything. People think that the cover-up is just the fact that there were no Islamic terrorists, right? That's the, that's the cover-up that was given to the mainstream, right? But people, like, people such as the people in this audience who said, I don't believe that, right? They had to be managed, right? And they had to be managed to prevent them discovering this hidden technology. And this was the second part of the 9-11 cover-up, to keep the, the technology that did this hidden. And what this has involved is creating bogus researchers, some of them scientists, and groups to steer those questioning the official narrative towards conventional explanations. So it was done by bombs, or it was done by nukes, or it was done by thermite and they have been very successful at this. Uh, intelligence agencies are well practiced in setting up fake companies, uh, fake pressure groups, fake websites. They do it all the time. It's their bread and butter. And that's what they've done with the 9-11 Truth Movement. 
One person who has exposed a lot of this is Andrew Johnson. He's been featured on my show a lot. As he got involved quite a few years ago now with some of these groups that contain scientists that were trying to find the truth about 9-11, or he thought they were trying to find the truth about 9-11, because Andrew posted some physics equations on a website, and he was asked to join one of these groups. Having read this, Andrew, you know, it just becomes apparent what a battle you've been involved in over the last five or six years. Mm -hmm. It really, you know, you are Judy Wood's pit bull terrier. Uh, that's the impression I get by reading this. And it's, um, it must be, well, even slightly traumatic for you over the last, I, I would just from reading your book, that, that, that you, you really, it really has been a battle of, of wills. It's definitely been a battle. And I think it's, I've described this as a numbers game. I mean, essentially what, to summarise what's going on is perception management. I basically put down a little calculation about the free fall, which is very simple. You know, you use the laws of motion, S equals UT plus a half AT squared, which is one of the equations of motion which you study at uh, in, in your physics A level. Or I don't know if they still do it at GCSE now. but V so squared I, equals U squared plus 2AS as well. Uh, that's one of the other equations of motion. That's right, right. That's, that's it. And um, so, you know, you can derive from that the free fall time of the towers based on the acceleration due to gravity and so on. It's a very, very simple calculation when you know how to do it. Mm. And I'd been posting that around various forums, one of which was a physics forum, and that generated oh, a couple of thousand responses, I think, over a period of about a year, 18 months or so. And I have a feeling that because I was trying to approach it from that angle, Somebody was, uh, you know, looking out for the people on the internet that were doing that. Right. And I got an email from Stephen E. Jones at the end of 2005, I believe it was December. Now, it transpired later that this scholars group seemed to have been formed after a meeting between David Ray Griffin and Dr. Judy Wood. And she's spoken about this, that she had a meeting with him in, I think, about July 2005, around that sort of time. And um, she, Judy, Dr. Judy Wood gave David Ray Griffin her card. And, and she said, well, we need to get some scholars together to, you know, to, to, to actually question the official story and so on. And it was then, at the end of 2005, that this group formed. I was invited to join the scholars group, and I thought, hooray, hooray, you know, some academics are actually trying to do something now after, yeah. you know, uh, uh, sort of uh, f four years of, of just nothing, really. Dr. Judy Wood and Dr. Morgan Reynolds published this article because they were very unhappy that Stephen E. Jones had been promoting that thermite was the, one of the main causes of the destruction of the buildings. Thermite is not an explosive. And when Jones put this into his presentation in February 2006, he said, thermite plus other explosives. And Dr. Wood had had various debates with Stephen E. Jones in email and, and sort of said, well, why, you know, what, why are you saying this with thermite when you can't, we don't really have enough evidence at this point to say that, yet you're claiming that that's what was used. And then Jones published this paper which um, you know, Dr. Judy Wood did, certainly didn't endorse. And he published that at the end of uh, 2005, and I was one of the reviewers on that. Uh, and I, you know, I mean, with my limited knowledge at that time, I couldn't see anything wrong with it. And now I look back and uh, you know, I think how, how silly I was. And then I became aware of Dr. Judy Wood's research. There became a, a need, as I saw things, to document what was actually going on, because I saw that pe certain people were acting to try and keep that research marginalised. It became clear to me that a, a number of people weren't happy with me uh, and others you know, trying to support what Judy Wood was doing and her right. research. She didn't, because she was seeing all these strange effects, she didn't really know what to call it. She knew it wasn't explosives, she knew it wasn't a gravity fire collapse, so she was a bit lost to, to know what to call it. All, she could, all could, she, she could see was the energy effects at that point, and that was sort of between 2000 and I think 2004 and 2006. Stephen E. Jones says, well, I can't associate with Judy Wood anymore. You know, again, he didn't say that literally, but that he wanted to form this other website, and that was called Scholars for 9-11 Truth and Justice. Now, it turned out later that Stephen E. Jones, I found out about a year after this, that he was connected to the Cold Fusion uh, research in 1989. And that was a very interesting connection because that had a direct connection into energy, the energy issues. Prior to the 1989 announcement, Stephen E. Jones, a physics professor at nearby Brigham Young University, learned of Pons and Fleischmann's work through an informant at the DOE. 
In a flagrant example of shameless opportunism, Jones insisted on going public quickly with his comparatively much less clear results. Disparaging the excess heat claims of Fleischmann and Pons, Jones' announcement would have effectively prevented the two scientists from patenting their process, a process they had developed on their own over long years of research. Dr. Judy Wood's assistant, Michael Zabur, um, who was helping uh, Dr. Wood, had some inside knowledge of energy technology. Can you expand on that, Andrew? So, so it would appear. I mean, you know, when we found this connection between Stephen E. Jones and Cold Fusion, which we weren't aware of initially, I'd never heard of him in that capacity, but I knew about Cold Fusion. Uh, and so when this came up, I think in 2007, uh, we saw this video of him in, in this two, year 2000 documentary called Heavy Watergate. You can see Stephen E. Jones in this documentary mentioned and referenced, and he's mentioned in Eugene Malov's book. Uh, Dr. Eugene Malov was a researcher who resigned from Massachusetts Institute of Technology over the cold fusion affair. Because he knew and could prove that cold fusion worked. Yes, essentially. It produced yes. energy from the quantum right. vacuum or wherever. Wherever. It's, and it's a nuclear, it's, the other thing is it's a, some type of nuclear reaction. Mm -hmm. And this is what the Hutchinson effect also seems to create. Mm -hmm. It's some type of nuclear effect which comes into play both in cold fusion and in the Hutchinson effect. If you look at the way that materials uh, can be mm -hmm. uh, transmuted, for example, that's a common element in this. Now, Yuzhi Malov was murdered in 2004. He was, which coincidentally was just over a year before Stephen E. Jones came onto the scene. And Yuzhi Malov's book mentions Stephen E. Jones on 100 pages. So he, he knew, and, he was and, and very Mike, familiar with Stephen Michael E. Jones. Michael Zabur, who had access to Malov's work. It, essentially, he probably would have because, well, basically, Michael Zabur wanted to tell Dr. Wood that he knew about energy. And it turns out that Michael Zabur had an uncle called William Zabur who ended up working with Eugene Malov on this New Energy Foundation, which was basically a, a project they started to try and find research funds for people, you know, for example, like John Hutchison, to continue looking at this new energy technology, this free energy technology. And Michael Zabur was murdered in 2006. He was. He was. You know, you get the good material, which is fairly clear cut, and then if you can associate that with stuff that's more woolly or not proven or not provable, mm -hmm. then you can dilute the good information mm -hmm. and, 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 and really, in people's minds, you can introduce doubt, and that's what this is all about. I just want to talk about, briefly, Richard Gage. The one thing I learned about Gage, and Edge Media Television have been repeating his 9-11 lectures. He's an architect who gives the standard controlled demolition thermite story and uh, for me he's as bogus as a six pound note. Uh, he, he said that he was asked whether he, he knew about the seismic activity on 9-11 and he said he hadn't even looked at the data. That he's travelling around the world, all different countries, giving these 9-11 truth lectures and he hasn't looked, bothered to check whether there was a seismic trace. Now, for me, that's a key thing that someone who is supposedly scientifically putting information forward about 9-11, did the buildings make a clatter when they hit the ground? And how long did it last for? And what was the size of that clatter, basically? And he hasn't even looked at that. He mm -hmm. isn't even aware that the, of the trace. Well, that's right. I mean, he, he even, we have another a video of him, on, and I, I, my, if my memory is correct on that particular one, he says the reason why he doesn't discuss the seismic data is he doesn't understand it. Mm -hmm. And that's what he actually says in this video clip. Yeah. So, and, and there are many issues with Richard Gage. Um, you know, basically, I, 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 I've, you know, I've written about this on my website, and we have this interview where he describes Dr. Judy Wood's research. Uh, he, he described Dr. Judy Wood's practice in witchcraft. 
because she won't talk about these iron microspheres, mm -hmm. which is nonsense because if you look on page 332 of her book, you'll find the iron microspheres are discussed in her mm -hmm. book. So he's lying about that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and the list with Gage goes on and on. You know, I mean, we've got, I've got quite a lot of information on him now. And you had previously written to other BBC producers in the past. I'll just read out a little uh, section here, Andrew. Um, this is in connection with news director Helen Borden. Oh, yes. Uh, where you say, um, regardless as campaigners, we will continue to reveal the truth about 9-11 to the British public. And I now personally regard the media as a controlled entity and one that is ducking its responsibility. It is therefore my responsibility to spend my own time and money to promulgate the truth about 9-11 being an inside job, and I will, unless this programme changes things, continue to discuss my email exchanges with BBC News Director Helen Borden, who has blatantly ignored evidence and refused opportunities for us to present our evidence in some broadcast vehicle or other. This is now documented and will, if possible, be used to prosecute the BBC for a breach of its charter. So all of this correspondence you've had with the BBC, Andrew, where you've brought it to their attention about the work of Dr Judy Wood and what really happened on 9-11. They're going to be in court one day, hopefully. 